Good morning. We follow the order of Matins in the Lutheran service book on page 219, or probably uh, many other orders of Matins in other Christian hymn books. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ. Alleluia. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O come, let us worship him. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. The deep places of the earth are in his hand. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hand formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O oh, come, let us worship him. Psalm number 107, verses 1 to 9. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble, and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We continue with the, old, the hymn for the, the office. Our, our office hymn is number 537 in the Lutheran service book. And the number in the TLH will also be listed below for you. Beautiful Savior. Beautiful Savior, King of creation, Son of God and Son of man truly i'd love thee truly i'd serve thee light of my soul my joy my crown fair are the meadows fair are the woodlands robed in flowers of blooming spring jesus is fairer jesus is purer he makes our soaring spirit sing fair is the sunshine fair is the moonlight bright the sparkling stars on high jesus shines brighter jesus 
cause shines purer than all the angels in the sky. Beautiful Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God and Son of Man, glory and honor, praise, adoration, now and forevermore be thine. The Old Testament lesson for the sixth Sunday of Easter comes from Numbers chapter 21. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at it, at the, ser at the bronze serpent, and live. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson comes from 1 Timothy chapter 2. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a, quiet, a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between, man, between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. And our gospel lesson comes from John's gospel, chapter 16. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that... I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. We'll sing the Easter Responsory on page number 222. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim his salvation from day to day. Give to the Lord all glory and strength. Give him the honor due his name. Alleluia, alleluia. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. Give to the Lord all glory and strength. Give him the honor to his name. Alleluia, alleluia. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Give to the Lord all glory and strength. Give him the honor to his name. Alleluia, alleluia. 
At this time, we'd often collect our offering, and during this time of pandemic and these digital services, you may make your offering by e-transfer or by uh, setting up a direct deposit system with our treasurer, and the email address for that is listed below. But now we will continue with our sermon today, and our sermon comes from the book of Numbers and chapter 21. I'll read these words once more for us, the words of the people Israel. Why have you brought up us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. This is our text. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The book of Numbers is a book we don't often turn to in the Bible, is it? It's a, it's a book that if we even know anything about the book of Numbers, we tend to think, well, you know, Leviticus is all the rules, and then Numbers is where they have to go through the desert, and they all go to the promised land. And then, you know, at the end of, of Numbers, then you have Deuteronomy, you have Moses telling them the rules again because they're going into the promised land. And then we have the book of Joshua where they go into the promised land. And that's good. If anyone knew that much or had that understanding of the book of Numbers, I'm not going to criticize them. I'm going to, to be actually very quite, quite proud as a pastor. But the book of Numbers is one we don't read a lot in church. And yet it's a book almost tailored for this time. It's a book about people wandering around in this holding pattern, in this desert, for a very long time. And they don't know when they're going to get out of it. Now, the book of Numbers that we heard from today was a terrifying story, a story that probably got removed from later editions of the lectionary because people think it's scary or it's barbaric or it's old-fashioned, it's tribal, uh, that these people complain to God and God sends serpents at them. Well, it is true, but we're only getting a little snippet. We're only seeing a little bit of the story of Numbers, and so it's like walking into an argument in the middle of it, and we haven't heard all the things that have gone on before, we don't really get the story. And so it's easy to look down upon God if you don't understand the whole story. So what is the whole story? Well, let's jump back. If you have your Bibles with you, you can flip to Numbers chapter 13. And let's remember that at this point, God's people had been slaves in Egypt. Uh, a slavery that was very bad, right? It wasn't a uh, there, there have been versions of slavery throughout history that have been better and worse, but uh, the slavery they went through was pretty horrific, right? The Pharaoh, he tried to genocide the people. He was killing their children. They were building mud bricks without straw, uh, and they were being whipped and, and beaten almost to the point of death. Uh, it was not a good place that they were in when God rescued them from that. So he delivered them. He delivered them through the Red Sea. We talked about last week how God parted the Red Sea, and they walked through on dry ground, this generation, these are the ones who made these complaints that we heard this week. Well, what happens in the story? Well, God leads them into the wilderness, and he's excited. Uh, the relationship between God and his people in the Bible is often spoken of as a husband and a wife. Uh, God is, is the husband, and Israel, the church, is his bride. And so, God has this married relationship with his people. And he's like an excited husband who says, man, I'm excited. I've prepared this house for you. Oh boy, I'm going to carry you through the threshold. I'm going to walk you through that door, through the Red Sea. And I'm going to show you all that I've prepared for you. I'm going to show you all of the, the wonderful things uh, that I have in store for you. And he's prepared it. And so he says, just before that, before you go into the house, before you go into the promised land, I'm going to tell you, you know, go and, and Israel's 12 tribes, remember? So uh, every tribe of Israel, you know, pick one person from your tribe uh, and then they're going to go out and they're going to be spies into the land. They're going to get a sneak peek. It's like opening a bit of a present uh, before Christmas. You're looking in to see what is in store for you. And so God sends them out on that mission and he's excited right? And he sends them out on the mission to spy into the land and to see, he says, you know, go in and get the reports of all the good stuff that's waiting there. And so the 12 guys get picked and they go out and they go into the land for 40 days and they come back. And you know what they say? No, no, this land, you think we can get through this land 
Uh, Their report is given in Numbers chapter 13, picking up at verse 27. And they told them, we came to the land to which you sent us. Yeah, they say, yeah, it flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong. And the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. So... To put, translate this in the 21st century, they're saying, you know, there's all sorts of things that are wrong with this promised land. It's like the, the wife going into the house and saying, what? The stairs don't have a baby gate? You know, they, they, kids could fall down there. What? There, there's this, this new set of knives you got me? I could cut myself on those, right? You know, God shows them all the great things that he's prepared and all they bring are their fears. All they bring are, is their complaints before God. How much has God given us? And how many are our fears? How many are our complaints? And so they're afraid to go. They say, sorry guys, this promised land thing, not going to happen. God's not big enough, apparently, to, to take care of this. He's not, he's not strong enough to lead us through. You know, he, he might have spread uh, the Red Sea for us so that we could walk through on dry land. But no, they have walls. Uh, we're not going to be able to get through those. Humans are funny in their proclivity to disbelieve, to doubt. And yet here we are all the time, doubting. And questioning God's word and his promise. There is one spy amongst them who speaks up in all of this. Caleb, verse 30. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Right? Caleb, he is the one person. He represents that remnant of the Bible, the faithful, the people who keep trusting God's promises despite all of their fears, despite all the doubts that they might have. They say, let's go with it. If God says we can do it, then we can do it. Then let's go. What are we waiting for? But there's the breakdown. There's the argument between God and his people. And the majority of the people aren't like Caleb. The majority of the people don't believe God's promises. And they say, no, we, we're not going to go. And so they're stuck. What are they going to do? What are they going to do? They're in the desert now. They've just escaped Egypt, which would still be happy to enslave them. And they're in the desert. And then there's the promised land ahead of them. And they are too scared. Uh, to go on. They are too faithless to go on. And so God says, well, you were in the promised land for 40 days, and I'm going to let you wait in the desert for 40 years. 40 years represents one generation, a generation that walked through the desert and walked through the Red Sea into the desert. They're not going to get to go into the promised land. Not even Moses, who had been a, a faithful leader for the most part. He had his mistakes for sure. Um, and, and he was judged for the, the sins that he committed. Um, however, he wouldn't get to go into the promised land either. That's what makes it so exciting in the Gospels. When you see Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration, he finally made it into the promised land after all those years. Uh, it's a, a really neat moment in the Bible. But Moses and the rest of them, they're going to die in the wilderness. They're not going to get to go into the promised land. They didn't want to go. Uh, and so here we are at this awful argument. Here we are in this house. Uh, how many of us have been in that situation in a household before where there's an argument, there's a breakdown, there's something that won't, there's an impasse uh, and people aren't going to see eye to eye. God and his, his people are, are fighting as it were and God's people are saying, no, uh, we won't go. And so that's where we are in the book of Numbers. We're a little bit further than that when we get to this issue. Now God had provided for his people. He'd given them manna, he'd given them bread from heaven, even in the desert, so that they wouldn't starve. When they complained about the manna, he gave them quail so that they could enjoy that. Uh, The Lord provided them with water. He provided them with what they needed to survive and to go through this time of trial, and yet they just complained, right? So we get to our our chapter today, chapter 21. We hear, you know, they're going around, uh, and the people become impatient, on the way. They're impatient. Man, I wonder what that would be like to live in a world where everyone's impatient, where everyone's ready to get on with things. Uh, And that's where they are. And so the people take their impatience and they're exactly where they wanted to be. They didn't want to go into the promised land. Uh, So they're there uh, in the wilderness. Uh, The only other thing they they usually say is that they'd rather be dead in Egypt. Uh, You've heard people make those type of complaints before too. And so they look at Moses and they look at God, the ones who had provided for them, the ones who had promised them these things, the ones who were still bearing the the burden of leadership. And they said, we're going to complain, you know, that if there's never a a situation where we can't complain, right? And so they're going to take this time and complain to them. And it's interesting that it says here that they 
the people spoke against God and against Moses because Moses had been put there by God and so and Moses was doing what God told them to do. So when we speak against our leaders who are, are doing what God tells them to do, whether they're spiritual or temporal, we're actually speaking against God too. We're not just criticizing a person, we're criticizing the Lord who put them in control. And so that is the situation. They make this complaint about it. They say, uh, there is no food and no water and we loathe this worthless food. No food, no water, but we hate the food. Well, obviously there must be food then, right? It's like a child who complains, when are we going to eat? And then you give them their food and they say, we don't want to eat this, right? There's always human sin, the sinful hearts that we all have. Uh, there's always something to complain about. There's always something to gripe uh, against God for. And so that's what these people are going to do. And so this is the point. This is where we are when the snakes come in, when God sends the snakes. There's no exegetical backflips that I can do out of that one. It is true that there were snakes that did abound in the region there that were venomous. Uh, fiery is the, the archaic English translation. Uh, it's seraph in Hebrew. It describes the fieriness of their bite, the burning of the venom. And so uh, the snakes that were around, they, they go and they plague this people. And so uh, God's not ashamed to have it written down either, right? It's right there in the Bible. The Lord said, the snakes, uh, I, again, tried to do my, my exegetical gymnastics to get out of it. Nope. In Hebrew, it's a pale. It's a causative. It means that God caused the snakes uh, to go towards them. Uh, and they suffer, right? And in this part of the story, we feel sorry for who? Do we feel sorry for God who's provided all of this? Do we feel sorry even for Moses? No, we feel sorry for the people who have complained, who have shown a total lack of faith, who have rejected God's promises and his plan for them. Uh, and we feel sorry for the criminals. And that shows us that we are sinners. We are one of them. We are the rebels. And so we feel sorry for them rather than for the ones who were wrong done, uh, for the victim, right? We feel more sorry in our world for the criminal than for the victim. Uh, and so we see God as the bad guy sometimes when we look at this from a sinful perspective rather than looking through it the lens of justice and realizing, yeah, they actually hadn't done anything right uh, and, and they're left to their own devices, right? You're in a, a snake inhabited area uh, and snakes come upon you uh, suddenly. Well, this is what happens when God's hand of protection is removed. Uh, and it's interesting. Again, I imagine people start seeing the snakes coming in and their thought isn't, maybe we've done something wrong. Their thought isn't, well, maybe we should repent. Maybe we should pray. No, the snakes come in and they say, yeah, we'll deal. We'll manage on our own. And what happens? The snakes bite them and they start to die. In fact, many of them die. And then, once the death toll rises, once there is a body count, then suddenly, maybe we should repent. Maybe we should actually go and say sorry for what we've done. Maybe we should ask for forgiveness. That's when it says, verse 7, And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us pray. That's the scariest part of the passage to me is when you just say, well, can you pray? Because God hasn't promised any cure for their predicament, right? They, they've repented and they're, they know that God is a merciful God. It is true. God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, but they don't have any promise that they can, can get rid of snakes, that this can be spared from them. And so they say, you know, okay, we've done what's wrong and we're going to go and we're going to, to repent. Uh, and a, a, an interesting point is, despite all their sins, they don't say, well, we'll repent as long as he stops this, as long as God rescues us. We are more impious than a lot of the people of Israel. We often say in our bargains with God, Lord, I'll stop doing this if you just do X, Y, Z, right? We think we're on an equal footing with God. We are sinners. We have wronged God. We are not on an equal footing. He doesn't owe us anything, but he is gracious and he gives us a great many things. In our current predicament, in this time of plague, we don't have a promise that we could get out of it. We don't have a, a promise that says that we, we always have to have an easy life, that we always get to have things the way that we want, that we never have to be inconvenienced. Those are silly promises. Those are false promises. But what can we do? Well, we can learn to pray. St. Paul told us in the epistle lesson to make prayers and intercessions for all people. How many of us have been praying 
during this time, have we been making intercession for the kings and for governors? Maybe we have in these services, but I, I've braided all this week for public health officials. I don't believe. Maybe I have, and I'm simply forgetting. But how often do we pray, right? Scripture tells us to pray without ceasing. So I think we ought to be praying a little more during this time of crisis. God's people, when they were in a crisis, they prayed. Are we ones who would pray as well? Well, whether we get to go to the promised land, and we already live in, in the promised land, let's, let's be real. Uh, we live amongst the, you know, the, the richest and the happiest, even the poorest among us live amongst the richest and happiest people who've ever been on earth, right? We have more than, than these people could ever dream of in the scripture. Uh, and so we're kind of already in the promised land, and we've kind of been kicked out of the promised land during this time of quarantine. We're kind of on a lockdown away from the promised land. And so whether we, we get out or not, we don't have a, a sure promise. It is very likely that we will. People have always gotten out of these quarantines. But what are we doing during this time of quarantine? Well, we should be praying. We should be turning to God. We should be repenting of what we have done wrong. You see, the people like to complain to God about what he hadn't given them. And yet we're told to repent. Repent means to complain about ourselves, to complain to God about God. Why am I so bad? I've done this and that and I shouldn't have, you know, I've had a spirit of bitterness. I've had a heart of jealousy. I've been ungrateful for all the things that you've given me. So we need to, to repent. We need to turn to God in prayer. But we do have a promise. We are not left without any promise besides God's general goodness and general niceness. Uh, we are left with the promise of Jesus Christ. Jesus picking up on this story in Numbers, points to it in John's gospel and says that he is the snake. He's the one lifted up, right? The Lord does give salvation to his people in this situation. He tells Moses to make a fiery serpent and put it on a pole and everyone who looks to it in faith is saved, right? Uh, that's probably your last inclination in life. You have a snake at your ankles. You have snakes moving around on the ground. Where are you going to be looking? Are you going to be looking down at your feet? Because you're going to try and outsmart them. You're going to try and be quicker than a snake that can move qu quicker than humans can blink. Or are you going to be looking at the token of trust? Are you going to be looking at the bronze serpent? Are you going to be looking at Christ? Are you going to be looking at the crucifix during tough times? Are you going to be trusting in the Lord who delivers from trouble? That was their test in the desert. Could we look at the bronze serpent even when we are suffering from this bite? Can we look away from our problems and look to the God? who delivers us from our problems. So Jesus says he is the bronze serpent. He is the one who is lifted up upon the cross with his arms outstretched, dying for your sins and for my sins, for all of us, so that we could have a sure promise, so that we could know that our sins are forgiven, that our place in heaven is guaranteed, that we will be forgiven, that we will be saved. And this is all offered to us by God's grace and because of Christ. And so we have that promise written down, friends. Nothing can take away that promise. When we go to God for forgiveness, we don't go like the people of Israel went, saying, hopefully, saying maybe. No, we go with certainty. We know that the Lord has forgiven us because of Jesus Christ. You have a yes in Jesus Christ to the plague of sin, death, and hell. You will be spared those things because you trust in Jesus. Christ is the one who is lifted up on the cross for us. He was the one who suffered the fiery wrath of God for our sins so that we don't have to suffer the fiery wrath of hell, so that we don't have to suffer the punishment that the serpent and all of his rebel followers will go to. Because in the end, you can go with God, you can go with his promises, you can be like Caleb, who says, yes, I believe, or you can be with those grumbling people of Israel who say, no, we don't trust you, we'll be on our own fine, just thanks. And, you know, that's where the serpents are. That's a scary thing to be in a world that's fallen and that's leading to death and where there are venomous, fiery serpents without God's protection and his provision. So let us take this lesson today and let us turn to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you as sinners, as people who have grumbled in our hearts, this week and in each of our lives, people who have complained before you, uh, we've not been grateful as we should have. We have not loved you with our whole heart. 
and we have justly deserved your punishments. And so we ask for grace, we ask for forgiveness, we ask for mercy, and we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. During this tough time of pandemic, Lord, you have entrusted us with temporal governments, which are not perfect, but we pray for them. We pray for Justin, our prime minister, uh, for Scott, our premier, for all of our public health officials during this time of pandemic, and we ask that you would bless them with wisdom, guidance, intelligence, prudence, Lord, so that this pandemic would be dealt with in a timely manner. And we pray even by your miraculous grace that you would end this. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we lift up before you all the people in our congregation who are suffering this week. Those who are lonely, those who are depressed, those who are suicidal, those who are sick, those who are troubled. Lord, you know the burdens of each one of their hearts and we entrust them to your goodness, knowing that you are the healer, that you are the great physician. And so we ask you to bless them. We ask you to heal with them. them. We ask you to go with them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, for the Christian faith during this time, for our church, for this broadcast, Lord, we pray that you would open hearts, you would turn those who are bitter and who are complaining and who are grumbling against you to repent of their sins, to believe in you and to look to Jesus Christ, the one who was lifted up for all of our sins. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And taught by our Lord Jesus and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We'll sing now our final hymn for the day. Drawn to the cross which thou hast blessed. As we think of the people of Israel who were drawn to the image of the bronze serpent on the pole and they looked to it and they were healed we also should look to the cross. We should look to Jesus Christ. And this hymn is all about that. Hymn number 560 in the LSB and the number in the TLH will be listed below as well. Drawn to the cross which thou hast blessed With healing gifts for souls distressed to find in thee my life, my rest. Christ crucified I come. Thou knowest all my griefs and fears. Thy grace abused my misspent years. Yet now to thee with contrite tears. Christ crucified I come. Wash me and take away each stain. Let nothing of my sin remain. For cleansing though it be through pain, Christ crucified I come. And then for work to do for thee, which shall so sweet a service be that angels well might envy me. Christ crucified I come. God bless you.